And now I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus, who is a staff doctor in AMC's oncology service. Dr. Hohenhaus is double board certified in oncology and small animal internal medicine. She's also a veterinary journalist who has written for many news outlets, and she hosts a monthly radio show, Ask the Vet, on Sirius XM, which is also now a podcast. So last July, Dr. Hohenhaus did a medical Mythbusters Beeline edition for us, and we're so thrilled to have her back tonight to take on some longstanding dog myths. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Thanks so much for the very kind introduction, Michelle. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And, and Michelle told me that, that it's almost exactly a year ago that we did uh, the Feline Mythbusters lecture. So I am going to, let's see, share my screen. Where is that button? Here we go. Um, and I'm going to make it big. And there we go. Um, a, a lot of really cute dogs, although I have to say the one kind of down low looks sort of like a squirrel, but that's okay. And I'm going to make my pointer work. And so this one looks much more like a squirrel than a dog, in my opinion. Um, so I, Michelle's covered a lot of the um, things that I could say about myself as an introduction. I am a veterinarian uh, and I've worked almost my whole career here at the Animal Medical Center, not quite all of it. And as Michelle said, I'm a specialist in both oncology and in small animal internal medicine. And recently I was um, asked to join the World's Small Animal Veterinary Association Oncology Working Group, which goes by the acronym WOW, which I think is just a great name for a group. And so I'm having a really fun time collaborating with um, colleagues from all over the world when we have a meeting outside of some people's windows, it's dark because it's actually the middle of the night because they're in Hong Kong and, and some of us are here in the US and other people in Europe and South America. This picture is one of my favorite pictures of the Animal Medical Center. Um, a colleague of mine was in a helicopter, flew over, snapped this shot, and took this picture. Uh, Note it, it's pre-pandemic, pre-tent, and pre-construction. Um, but this is one of the rare pictures of the building in its entirety. Um, so we're going to talk today about uh, dogs and worms because worms there's a lot of myths surrounding worms in dogs uh, there's also a lot of myths about what dogs eat uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about bones and tennis balls then we're going to talk about spaying and neutering and finally we're going to talk about dogs and aging uh, so we're going to run the gamut today so the first myth is going to be um, a scooting dogs have pinworms. Uh, you'll see a dog put its fanny on the ground, the carpet, uh, the grass, and slide along. And oftentimes those dogs come to see me with the owner complaint that the dog has pinworms. So pinworms are Enterobius vermicularis, and these are not a zoonotic disease. A zoonotic disease is one that is shared between people and animals. So since this is not a zoonotic disease, this is in fact a human disease that is not transferable to dogs. Um, so dogs can't get pinworms. Um, I don't know what people with pinworms look like because I actually don't do sick people. I do sick dogs and cats. Um, but these, this is a picture here of a pinworm uh, under a microscope. And then these are pinworm eggs. And that's um, something that many dog and cat owners don't know is that when we as veterinarians look at a fecal sample, we look not usually for the worms themselves in the stool, but we look for the eggs. Um, and so we see all kinds of things that look very much like these pinworm eggs um, when we're looking for hookworms or whipworms or roundworms. So we look for the eggs rather than the whole worm itself. It's unusual actually to see a whole worm uh, from a dog or a cat. So then if, if dogs don't get pinworms, then why are dogs who come to see me scooting? Well, 
uh, carnivores, um, dogs, cats, possums, hyenas, and skunk. And here we have the very famous Warner Brothers character, Pepe Le Pew, after Penelope, the cat who walks under white, wet paint all the time, looks like a cat, and then Pepe Le Pew um, pursues her. Um, and it, it, I'm sure Penelope has been having a Me Too moment um, this year because Pepe is unrelenting. Um, so these anal glands are a features of, feature of many animals who are carnivorous. And this is a very anatomic drawing of where dogs' anal glands are. So here's his tail, and here's his little butthole here, and these two little teeny pink kind of uh, orange segment shaped things are the anal glands or they might be called an anal sac sometimes. And all dogs have them, cats do too, um, to the right and left side of the rectum. And it's really very, very common for these glands to get inflamed, mostly from allergies. Sometimes these anal glands get abscessed and infected, and then the dog is terribly painful. Occasionally, we see a tumor of the anal gland, and all of these conditions can be um, assessed by simply a rectal exam of your dog. And so at least once a year, and with almost every single dog that I look at, I do a rectal examination because I'm feeling to see if the anal glands are too full, if they're painful, if there might be a tumor, among other things there. Um, so these anal glands, when they get full, are irritating to the dog, or if they're inflamed from allergies or an abscess, the dog will put its fanny on the ground and scoot. Um, and so that is why um, most dogs scoot. Now here is a video. All right. Uh, presenter next, see all slides. Maybe I have to do this. There we go. So this is a rectal exam. And so here is my most loved photo from Facebook. And you can see that I splattered the entire wall um, expressing the anal glands because when you squeeze them, sometimes they give way and it squirts all over the place. Uh, but you're happy because the anal glands are emptied and the dog is happy. So you can see that an, um, a rectal exam is not a big deal for this dog. Um, and it empties out the anal glands and then that helps to keep them from getting an abscess and keeps them from scooting their fanny on the floor. So then this scooting dogs have pinworms is in fact a myth. Uh, dogs don't get pinworms. And the answer is that anal gland disease is the most common cause of scooting in dogs. Now we're going to keep along our theme here of worms. And a lot of people say to me when I look at their dogs, does, it's, it's winter time. My dog doesn't need heartworm medication, right? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, heartworms are a parasite spread by the bite of an infected mosquito. And here's the mosquito biting. And then the mosquito ingests, ingests baby heartworms. And then the mosquito comes along and bites the next dog. And that mosquito injects those baby heartworms into the bloodstream of the healthy dog. And then these heartworms grow up over the next three months or so and migrate to the heart and lungs uh, within about two to three months after the bite of the infected mosquito. And then the heartworms grow up in the pulmonary blood vessels. And if your dog has a big dose of heartworms, it backs up into the heart, which is where it gets its name. And once your dog has adult heartworms living in the heart and lungs, then the next mosquito that comes by 
can bite your dog and take those heartworms to another dog. So heartworms are a, what we call a vector borne disease. The mosquito is the vector that transports heartworms from dog one to dog two. So should you give your dog heartworm medicine year round? Because you think of mosquitoes as being pretty seasonal. Well, one thing to remember is that New Yorkers love their dogs and New Yorkers travel a lot with their dogs. And so you can see that New York is this, um, this color blue, which means less than 1% of dogs in this area test positive for heartworms. But if in the when the bad weather comes in the winter and you start to migrate south, notice that the number of dogs testing positive for heartworm disease dramatically increases as you go south or to the south central states. And so if you travel with your dog, that is a really good reason why it should take heartworm medication year round. Here's another reason. This uh, movie map shows the expanding mosquito habitat between now and 2080. And this is a feature of uh, the global warming problem is that as it gets warmer, more habitat appeals to mosquitoes than it currently does. So notice that the mosquitoes move up into Canada, up into Siberia, and they also move further south because the weather conditions are more favorable towards mosquito growth. So as it means it's harder these days to predict where mosquitoes are going to be, and therefore your pet is at risk for being exposed to mosquitoes more of the year than it used to be. Therefore, uh, probably heartworm medication needs to be given year round. Now, this slide just shows some of the more common heartworm medications. And the question is, what's in heartworm medicine? And I'm thinking most of you haven't thought about that. So heartworm medication, this is a heartworm right here, this blue, blue purple thing. These, it's surrounded by red blood cells um, and it's, the heartworm has been stained so it shows up under the microscope. So there are two classes of drugs that treat heartworm disease. Um, one group is called the avermectins, and then there are three of those we use in dogs, ivermectin, selamectin, and moxidectin. And then there's another class of drug um, called milbamycin. And all of these, when they're in a medication, are there to treat heartworms. But heartworms medication also will often contain one or more of the drugs on this list, uh, pyrantal, plasiquantal, milbamycin. So sometimes uh, milbamycin is mixed with ivermectin to get a broader spectrum. Um, Afoxolaner, imidacloprid, cloprid, and lufeneron. And these drugs are in heartworm medication to control fleas, ticks, and other intestinal parasites. I just happen to have a picture of our friend, the tapeworm here, but these also control hookworms, roundworms, and whipworms. So heartworm medication is not just about heartworms. It's actually about uh, controlling external and internal parasites as well. So then Dogs need heartworm preventative only in the summer is in fact a myth because they need heartworm medication year round because heartworm medicine is not just about heartworms. It's about preventing parasites in general, external and internal, uh, to keep your dog as healthy as possible. The other thing is that some of these worms are potentially transmissible to people. And so by having your dog not have any intestinal parasites, everybody in the family is safer. Now, related to the uh, heartworm question and intestinal parasite question is deworming causes diarrhea. I don't know how many times people say to, when I say, oh, I think we need to deworm your dog. And then the people say, well, is that going to give him diarrhea? Well, what did I just say about all these heartworm medicines? Most of these, notice that, that say advocate here says in bold letters, fleas, heartworms, and worms. 
all the medications that I have on this slide have some intestinal parasite deworming capabilities. So you're, when you're giving heartworm medication once a month, um, you will be deworming your dog once a month. And most of you don't have a dog that has diarrhea once a month. And so deworming is actually very safe, has very few side effects. And I'm, I'd be surprised if lots of dogs have diarrhea um, from being dewormed. Usually if they have diarrhea, it's, it's because they have worms, not because they have been dewormed. Now, we're going to change a little bit and we're going to talk about things that dogs eat. Uh, so this is an endoscopic view of the inside of a dog's esophagus. And this is very seasonal because we've had a couple of these at the Animal Medical Center over the last few days. And this is a corn cob. You can see there's four kernels of corn still stuck on the cob that is stuck in the dog's esophagus. Uh, this is one of my most beloved patients. He's a very bad dog, but I like him for that reason. And you can see that he chomped on a stick and the stick broke off and wedged itself between his left and right molars. And the family didn't know what was wrong with him. They brought him in because he had bad breath. And when I opened his mouth up, I could see this stick in there that I had to kind of prod out of that location uh, with a tongue depressor and a, a hemostat grabbing device. And then this is the inside of the dog's stomach that contains a blue, highly decorated ball. I think it kind of has glasses and a smiley face on it. And then this is a piece of grass stuck to the ball. Um, so these are just some examples of the kinds of things that we take out of dogs here at the Animal Medical Center. So just thinking about what dogs eat, this is one of my favorite videos, why you should never invite a Labrador to dinner. It is just absolutely the best video and couldn't be captured more appropriately. So one of the questions that people often ask me about their dog is, should I give my dog a bone to keep their teeth clean? So if you ask the internal medicine doctors at the Animal Medical Center, they would say no, because bones are dangerous. And this is an x-ray of a dog from side to side. So this is his backbone here. This is his hips and the thigh bone, and then the knees are right here. And this is a dog's part of the dog's heart. And you see this, these are his ribs. And then all of a sudden you see this bone that is sticking way below the rest of the ribs. And that actually turned out to be a lamb rib bone that the dog got out of the trash and ate the bone. And it is sitting inside the dog's stomach from the very top to the very bottom of this dog's stomach. Now, this is another um, photograph of a bone in the uh, digestive tract of a dog. And you can see here the wall, the pink is the wall of the digestive tract. And then we've got this bone sitting right here that somebody had to go in with an endoscope and pull out. And surgery would say that bones are dangerous as well. And these are pre-surgery x-rays of a dog. And again, same orientation, backbone. Um, let me turn my laser pointer back on. Uh, hips, thigh bone. Uh, and the, this is a little bit of the heart here. And we see one, two, three, four things in here and lots of black bubbles. Those black bubbles tell us that something in the intestinal tract is blocking and the gas is accumulating and swelling the intestines up. And so when we see lots of gas and things that don't belong in the intestinal tract, then surgery says, oh, this dog is obstructed. And this dog had um, four rocks and a nylabone removed at surgery from its intestinal tract. It recovered and went home. Now, dentistry doesn't like bones either because dentistry says bones break teeth. 
And this is a beautifully reconstructed lower fang in a dog who chewed on a bone and broke his tooth. And you can see that there's this part down here is the original tooth. And this part up here is all brand new reconstructed tooth uh, with a lot of stitching uh, where they had to repair bone damage from eating the bone. So dentistry is also votes against bones. So bones do not help to keep your dog's teeth clean. They actually break teeth. Uh, they get stuck in dogs uh, and we have to fish them out with an endoscopes or we have to cut them out um, in the operating room. So bones, including nylon bones, are dangerous and really are not a good, uh, a good treat or entertainment that you should give to your dog. Now, this is a terrific picture. Um, I think there, there is a record holder, though, um, that came out during the pandemic, and it was a dog that could hold six tennis balls in its mouth at once. This dog only has five. Um, so we're going to investigate whether or not tennis balls are a safe toy for a dog is a myth or not a myth. So Internal medicine says no, that tennis balls are not a safe toy because this is the view with the endoscope again. Uh, pink is the inside of the stomach. This black line here is actually the endoscope um, that, and then it's curled around and looking back at us. And you can see that it sees a deflated tennis ball uh, in the stomach. Uh, dentistry says no, tennis balls cause enamel wear in teeth. So that furry stuff on the tennis ball is actually very, very abrasive and will rub off the enamel on the dog's teeth. And you can see here where the teeth are no longer pointy, they're flattened out. And you can see the inside layers of the tooth because the dog has worn all the enamel off its teeth from chewing on tennis ball fuzz. So dentistry is not wild at all about tennis balls as toys. And this is uh, a vote from surgery that tennis balls are not a good toy because this is actually, this right here is a tennis ball in the dog's stomach. And this one couldn't get pulled out with the endoscope because it was still intact. The deflated one is easy to grab, but as you can imagine, it's not easy to grab a inflated tennis ball. And this one was perfectly round uh, right here. So this is a dog that we had to remove the tennis ball by surgery. So then this is a big myth is that tennis balls are a safe toy for your dog. They are not. They're commonly swallowed and the fuzz on the tennis ball is really abrasive to the teeth. So if you supervise your dog when it has a ball, you might want to use this kind of tennis ball, which is a naked tennis ball. It's like a tennis ball without the fuzz. Um, but the fuzz is really uh, not good for their teeth. So look for fuzzless tennis balls. And then when your dog has one, be sure that it's supervised so that um, you know that they're not chewing it to bits and swallowing it down. Now, this is one that I think is getting a lot more attention these days. Um, so when I first was a veterinarian, pretty much all dogs uh, were spayed or neutered by about six months of age. And so the question is, is that a myth these days or is it uh, still dogma that stands? So why do we even spay, dog, spay and neuter dogs and cats? Well, some data from the shelter medicine um, statistics between 2015 and 2018 says that 1.6 million dogs and cats enter shelters annually. And of that 1.65 million, 1.5 million are euthanized. And so the early spay and neuter programs were put into place uh, to try and address this um, carnage um, that happens in the shelter system. So I wanted to ask the question, 
how many of the AMC patients are spayed and neutered? So um, I had our um, systems administrator look at the data on um, how many pets are spayed and neutered. And I looked over the past two years and you can see that um, we had 14,000 male dogs, 68% neutered. We had 12,000 female dogs, 75% were neutered. Of the almost 5,000 male cats, 87% were neutered. And of the female cats, uh, there were about 4,000 and about 84% were spayed. So what you see is probably reflects the fact that male cats that aren't neutered tend to spritz um, really smelly urine uh, to mark their territory. And so intact male cats are not the most um, enjoyable pets because they tend to smell really bad. So male, male cats clearly are on the top of the neutering list. Female cats higher than female dogs as well. And that's because when a female cat goes into heat, they are rolling, rubbing, crying, wailing, uh, looking for a boyfriend. And that goes on all breeding season unless the female cat uh, finds a boyfriend. So th that kind of behavior is not very um, fun for the family. And so I think that feline behavior it probably explains why these cats are neutered more often than their uh, canine counterparts. Okay. Now... I don't know why it doesn't want to go forward. Oops, too far. Okay. So the advantage of spaying and neutering is that for females, there's no heat cycle. And there you don't have uterine or ovarian diseases because the ovaries are removed. And most uterine diseases that happen are related to hormones that come from the ovaries. And then of course, obviously no puppies or kittens and female dogs and cats that are spayed early have a decreased risk of mammary cancer. In males that are neutered, they don't mark and male dogs, male cats are big markers. Male dogs will still mark some. And male dogs and cats, when there's a female in season, um, will behave sometimes very badly. Um, I had a patient once that like dug a hole through the plaster in the wall towards the next apartment. And it turned out there was a female in heat in that apartment and he was looking to have her and he did everything he could to get there. So male behavior when there's a female in season can be really annoying. Um, because the testicles are removed when a male dog is neutered, then you don't have any testicular diseases. And male dogs, but not cats, will have prostatic problems where the prostate can get very enlarged, can get abscessed, can get infected. And it sometimes is big enough that the dog is uncomfortable and strains to poop. So it is, um, there, there are def distinct health benefits um, to animals that are spayed and neutered. Um, in this particular study that was looking at um, inherited diseases and neutering, what they found was, was really, in my mind, very interesting. And that is that spayed and neuter dogs were less likely to be hit by a car, less likely to bloat, and less likely to develop a heart muscle condition called cardiomyopathy. And that I can kind of get the hit by car thing because animals that are looking to mate will go to great lengths to find um, a partner. And so they're out roving and roaming and then they get hit by a car. I don't really have a good explanation why there seemed to be this apparent decrease in bloating and heart muscle disease or cardiomyopathy in neutered animals, but it, it was kind of an interesting finding of this study. So the benefits of spaying and neutering extend beyond uh, reproductive issues. 
now the um, other things that uh, spaying and neutering have been associated with that are on the negative side are can be shown here. So this is a female dog and this little device right here is an implanted device called a hydraulic occluder that helps to deal with this dog's uh, urine dribbling problem. And so urine dribbling is associated with uh, early spaying of female dogs. This is the uh, front leg of a dog. And you can see here's bone. And then all of a sudden the bone looks kind of fuzzy. And then there seems to be some missing bone here. And this is a dog that has a tumor in its leg called osteosarcoma. And that tumor um, has been associated with dogs who are spayed uh, and neutered at younger ages. And then this is a knee. So this is the thigh bone and this is the shin bone. And this is a knee that's been orthopedically repaired by insertion of this little plate. Uh, and this plate is the method by which we repair uh, ruptured cruciate ligaments in dogs. And again, uh, ruptured cruciate ligaments have been associated um, with spaying and neutering in dogs. The other thing to keep in mind is that when dogs are spayed and neutered, their metabolism goes down. And so a lot of people blame spaying and neutering uh, for their dogs overweight and obesity. The real reality is they're just getting too much food uh, that they don't need. But a lot of people don't realize that they need to cut that food back when the pet is spayed and neutered to avoid um, them gaining a lot of weight. So because there have been these associations between a disease and spaying and neutering, people have started to look at trying to make recommendations. And it's very, very, very difficult to make these recommendations because if you spay and neuter early, there are certain advantages. And then if you wait, there are those advantages go away, but you gain other advantages uh, by waiting. And so this particular paper looked at dogs in five weight categories. So they small, medium, standard, large, and giant dogs. And they said, how old should this dog be for us to avoid joint disorders like cruciate ligament rupture and certain cancers like osteosarcoma and lymphoma? And then this chart makes recommendations. So here, males on this side of the chart, females on this side of the chart. If you have a small or medium dog, you can, it says choice. And what, what that means is the owner can choose. There's no medical advantage to sooner or later. Then if you have a standard size or a large breed dog, then they recommend waiting till a, a, a year or more of age. And in giant breed dogs, they talk about maybe waiting as long as two years before the dog is neutered uh, to protect them against joint disorders and cancers. And that's, that's far easier in my mind in the male dog than in the female dog, where some of my clients that have tried to follow recommendations like this um, find the heat cycle of the female dog is uh, problematic. So again, in uh, small and medium females, choice, uh, owner's choice as to when to spay them. Um, beyond 11 months, if it is a standard or large breed dog. And then this giant has an asterisk by it because the data wasn't clear enough that they could check this two year or more box, but they were kind of leaning towards doing that. And so that's why that asterisk is there is that they say, well, if you could wait, but if you have to wait until the dog is uh, two years old, then you've gone through probably four heat cycles. And for some people, that is a real challenge. Now, this is another paper that came out, uh, same authors uh, and very similar, asked a very similar question. And they said, um, in 35 breeds of dogs for which we have enough data to comment on specific breeds, at what age should we spay or neuter those dogs to protect against joint disorders, cancer, and 
in this paper, they added urinary incontinence, which remember I said is a problem in uh, some female dogs spayed early. And in this particular um, study, I, I can't recreate it all on a slide because it's 35 breeds of dogs, male and female, but there are recommendations for particular breeds as to whether you should spay them, uh, not at all, more than six months, more than 12 months, or more than 23 months of age. And so the link to this paper will be in the materials that Michelle said she'd be sending the attendees tomorrow. But this is a um, something that I look at when people are asking for my advice about optimal time to spay and neuter a dog. So then this is maybe sort of kind of a myth. Um, dogs maybe shouldn't all be spayed and neutered by six months of age. And so this is a point where it's really important for you to talk to your veterinarian about when your dog should be spayed and neutered because they will be the ones to know most about your particular dog and also to keep up on the latest changes in the research into this area. But there is, what is clear is there is no longer one size fits all for a recommendation. So this is one of my favorite topics and that is seven human years equals one dog year. And is that true or not? So let's see. So this formula just intuitively doesn't make sense because a one-year-old dog would be seven years old. And we know that a one-year-old dog is perfectly capable of having a litter of puppies, but a seven-year-old is not capable of having a baby. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't work on that end. And then a 16-year-old dog, which we see a fair number of 16-year-old dogs. So if you do the math, this dog would be um, 112 years old. Well, there aren't a lot of 112 year old people out there, but there are a lot more 16 year old dogs. So this formula fails at the top and bottom of the age range in the dog. So I don't think this seven year thing is not that good. So then this particular paper um, took a, a genetic approach. And what they did was they um, looked at DNA methylation. So they looked at your genes and how much change had happened to your genes over time. And then they created a formula that matched the age of people using Tom Hanks here as an example, and a cute Labrador puppy. So here's Tom Hanks at about nine, and here's the Labrador puppy at a similar age. And then we have Tom Hanks today, who he's about 65. And then they've got this Labrador here, who at nine years of age is roughly equal to Tom Hanks at 65. And they did this all by looking at changes in the DNA as you age. And those changes in the DNA happen to you, to me, to dogs, to cats. It's, it's a function of having older DNA. So this formula of DNA aging by methylation the formula is 16 times the natural log of the dog's age plus 31. So this involves higher math, but there is actually a dog age calculator for this formula on a website, which will be included in the materials that Michelle will provide you tomorrow. However, let's just look at a mini poodle, a golden retriever, and a great Dane. We got a small dog, kind of a typical dog at golden retriever size and a giant breed dog. And we all know that mini poodles live a long time and they, they can be really old and Great Danes don't necessarily live so long. So if we use this 16 times the natural log of the dog age plus 31, if you use that dog age calculator, a 12 year old mini poodle is the same as a 12 year old Great Dane. Well, every veterinarian knows that a 12 year old mini poodle is really not that old. And a 12 year old Great Dane is an antique. Um, you don't see them get very old, but using this formula, all of these dogs would be 70 point 
eight years in human age. And so as cute as that Tom Hanks chart is, I don't really think this one works very well either. So now in this particular study, which is from Purdue University, where they title of the study is as complicated as the formula, is the comparative longevity of pet dogs and humans implications for gerontology research. And this is the formula that they came up to convert dog age to human age. Notice there are three levels of parentheses in this. There is C, which is the chronologic age of the dog in years, cubed, squared, and just multiplied by. And X is the median age of death for that breed or size of dog. And so you've got X here and here and here. So it is incredibly complicated formula. However, now if we go back to our mini poodle, golden retriever and great Dane, and we say they are 12 years old in dog age, and we use this formula to calculate, what you see is the mini poodle is not that old, it's almost 60. And a 12 year old golden retriever is older and a 12 year old Great Dane is quite elderly. And this formula, complex as it is, really fits quite well with what we think about as how aged a dog really is when it's 12 years old. So then I think that this is clearly a myth. Seven human years does not equal one dog year. And that's because aging is not linear. You, you get old, you know, you, you mature much faster when you're young and then the curve flattens out as you get older. And that's why you need that very complicated formula to convert dog years to human years. And this is Colby Jack on his birthday. So now I've, I've come to the, the time that I plan to talk. And so I want to know if there are questions, which I see a bunch of comments in the chat. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hope that Michelle has organized all these questions for me to answer. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. And yes, we have some questions and some comments. Um, and this, the first one is something I, I've heard you talk about a lot. So um, Greg is saying, he said, I can only imagine the smell in the room with the wall spray. So I know the smell is another issue, right? Um, so. We have, yeah, we have a lot of wipes. Uh, we have a Swiffer wet jet in the office. And sometimes we, if we're seeing more than one pet from a family, we have to mop down the floor um, between visits. Um, so yes, um, I, you know, Febreze and a lot of other stuff, it does, it, it smells really bad. But, but these are, the anal glands are scent glands. And so they're to mark territory. And the, you know, the pinnacle of scent glands is the skunk. Uh, the skunk's anal glands are what we know skunks for. No, absolutely. Um, another similar comment um, about that her, uh, Katie saying her vet expressed her cat wall and vet recovered um good thing you know that his wife is used to her coming him coming home with a different set of clothes so anyway but yes the scent i know is it's like a fishy scent right so yes that's something yeah okay um i was actually there filming that and um steph's vet tech uh Anne's vet tech steph is the one who told me uh you may want to get stand to the side a little bit. So I didn't get afraid yeah. by that. So I, I, we didn't hear the audio there, but yeah, it was, it was good. So, um, okay, now let's move on a little bit to, to um, heartworm. Can you use heartworm preventative with a dog that has an autoimmune issue? Um, if so, is there a recommendation as to which type to use? I don't think that there've been any autoimmune diseases associated with heartworm medication. There are some breeds of dogs that are very sensitive to the ivermectin, though that group of drugs that end in mectin. But the dose to prevent heartworms is a little teensy tiny dose of heartworm medicine compared to some of the other um, diseases that we use um, the mectins for. And so it, that drug is even safe in those dogs that have a genetic sensitivity to 
that type of drug because of their their drug metabolism is different. So it is a really safe drug. And plenty of dogs have eaten a whole box of heartworm medicine at one time and only ended up with diarrhea because the cardboard box, you know, didn't agree mm -hmm. with them sort of thing. It, it Heartworm medicine is really very, very safe for everybody. And treating okay. dogs for heartworms is a terrible Sorry. thing. You don't want to have to have your dog treated for heartworms because it, some number of dogs throw a blood clot to their lungs and die. That's number one. And number two, the medicine seems to always be on back order. And so mm -hmm. you don't want your dog to have heartworms and that to be the year or month that the drug is back ordered. Okay, great. And I know there are many different kinds. Do you recommend talk to your vet? Your you know, what, every veterinarian your... has their favorite heartworm medication. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I can't recommend a specific one for any patient. Okay, great. Um, so let's see, moving on. Um, we have many questions about the teeth, which we also do have some dentist, dentistry lectures, um, which uh, you can find on our YouTube channel. But here, um, we're asking, what do you recommend for chewing? Um, bully sticks, no hide, stuffed tongs. I know someone asked about antlers, which I know that dentistry also says. Oh, chew. antlers, hooves, and bully sticks make uh, dentistry also crazy because they've got to reconstruct teeth all the time because those are really hard and fracture teeth. The other thing about bully sticks is they have a ton of calories. So mm. if you ha have a dog who is prone to being portly, bully stick is a really bad idea because it has a ton of calories in a bully stick. Um, so bully sticks are bad for teeth and bad for their waistline, no antlers, no hooves, uh, no marrow bones, all that kind of stuff. Um, Kongs, any a Kong product, which is kind of a, a rubbery thing that has a little give and you can buy softer and harder Kongs. Those are good. Um, Kongs often have an inside, a hollow inside, and then you can put something in there that the dog likes to chew or eat. And as it's, you put the food in there, you freeze it. And then as it thaws, the dog licks it out and chews it out. That's probably a much better alternative uh, to um, any of the bones and things. Um, soft toys, if the dog likes them, but just be careful because a lot of the dogs will rip the squeakers out. Uh, they somehow know there's a squeaker in there and then they disembowel the stuffed toy to get the squeaker out. Uh, although most dogs, those will pass. I don't, I don't remember a lot of dogs with squeakers stuck in them. Um, it, it's more balls and fabric and corn cobs and peach pits. Uh, trash is a big problem. Uh, we spend yeah. a lot of time here dealing with trash ingestion. Yeah. So one thing, another myth that, you know, I hear a lot when people say is that dogs have like a cast iron stomach. And I think judging from how many come in with vomiting and diarrhea, it's probably uh, not yeah. the case, right? It, so yeah. It, there are some dogs that seem to have a cast iron stomach and they can eat anything. The dog I showed you with the stick across the roof of his mouth, that dog eats dead birds constantly <laughs> and it doesn't seem to bother him. Um, but most dogs, if they eat non-food items is a real problem. Um, and, you know, I had dogs that went in the woods and ate some part of a dead deer and that was really not that good for them either they spent several days in the hospital detoxing so really if you can keep your dog from eating non-food items or things that you might think might be food but are rotten it would be definitely to your dog's advantage great um we have a question about uh no tennis ball fuzz was it what about the fuzz on plush toys well that's maybe more just fabric right which they yeah that, well. i don't think dentistry cares about the fuzz on plush toys it's that right that tennis ball stuff is really harsh right and the dog friendly tennis balls are, are as well like they're they're supposedly dog friendly but they're it's the same fuzz right so i don't think it's you know they're do supposedly softer but from what i've seen it's it doesn't seem to be um let's see so Okay, so what, um, we have Amy saying my neutered male dog marks a lot. How do I stop it? 
so barking i don't know that no, that's mar marking really, oh marking. Sorry, marking marking yeah um well you've got to distract them from doing the behavior that you don't want and reward them for the behavior that you do want um and so i'm not at all someone who is a big dog trainer um I, i'm you know i'm much better with cats than dogs <laughs> but the you need to you need to not punish them for what they do you don't like but you need to re reward them for what they do that you want them to do and it is a constant process you can't just spend an hour with the dog trainer on saturday and think that the dog is going to remember sunday monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday it is a go home and work with that dog for an hour every night until you get it to do the behavior that you want um yeah and and i think that i think amy if it's the same amy says that he barks a lot too mm -hmm. and when a dog barks, it, it's looking for attention. So then when you yell at the dog and say, be quiet, the, I don't think a dog can filter the difference between, oh, I love you and be quiet. They want attention. And so every time you yell at them, um, they say, oh, I'm gonna bark some more and get, get more attention. And so what you have to do is reward them for being quiet, teach them to go to their crate, their bed, whatever spot you want. And then when they start to bark, you say place and teach them to go to that place and give them a treat for that. But don't reward their barking by saying don't bark because that's what they want. Exactly, yeah, very good point. Um, on that note, we have um, uh, Marla, um, is it Maria? Um, I train dogs um, and she said she's had several clients over the years who have difficulty handling intact large male dogs um and i i know you and i have talked to that some of the like the dog parks in manhattan don't allow um intact dogs at after six months you know so i if it's a behavior issue back to that again you know you have to factor that in even with the help right so it could be you know if, if it's not working for you for your lifestyle or your dog is getting in fights that could be an issue too so i think talk with your vet, right? Just about the spaying age. Yeah. Like neutering age. Yeah. Well, and there, there are all kinds of reasons, all kinds of factors that go into different people's decisions on neutering. Um, so, you know, one of my colleagues has golden retrievers and people that have those dogs know that they tend to be very prone to cancer. And so mm -hmm. she's, she personally is worried about breast cancer in her golden retriever. And so she wants, and we had a very sad case of a golden retriever that wasn't spayed before six months and ultimately died of breast cancer. And we all felt very bad because we really liked this dog a lot. And she said, when I get my new puppy, when I go home to California, I'm it's getting spayed at six months because I don't want to have to go through this. And so some people's decision is colored by what they have previously experienced. And the reality is there there's some data to guide us but there's never as much data as you wish you had about when the optimal time to spay and neuter is so people are going to make different decisions for different reasons and if you want to go to the dog park then maybe you have to have your dog neutered at six months and if you adopt a dog from a shelter you have no choice in when they're neutered because they probably come neutered um mm -hmm. and you might not even know when they were neutered so um there's all kinds of different impact um of the neutering decision um uh, different people's lives are people are going to make different decisions good point yes um Here's a different question. Um, when will stem cell treatments be available for canines? Well, there are stem cell treatments available right now. Um, there are, people have looked at them for arthritis. People have looked at them for fixing kidney disease. Um, so there, there are some clinical investigations going on and some companies that will help collect the stem cells from your dog if you want them. Um, but it depends. Part of it is, what do you want the stem cells for? They, and then they could be used for a lot of different things. But they're out there, definitely. Okay, good. Um, Here's a, a question about eating grass, which I know that is another myth. Um, 
that dogs eat grass to vomit. So is Amanda's asking, is it okay to, for dogs to eat grass? Well, if mm -hmm. your dog eats, I mean, there's nothing toxic about grass for dogs. It's just that dogs are not cows and they're not designed to eat grass. And so all that fiber either just goes through them or comes back up again. I don't know that, I don't really believe that dogs eat grass to throw up. I think the dog's not feeling well and then it starts doing weird things and sometimes they eat grass, but grass isn't going to hurt your dog. And I don't think I've ever seen a dog have an intestinal obstruction from grass, but if it makes them vomit, don't give them access to grass. That would be my take on it. And obviously pesticides, stay away from that as well. So, well, yeah. usually if, if you, you know, if there's chem lawn has been there, usually there's a little sign that says keep your yeah. dog off or in Central Park, it says rat poison here, stay away. And, you know, follow those signs but yeah, just your basic grass in the backyard um is probably not toxic to the dog good okay good um we have a question about new treatments for mast cell tumors um such a common cancer so mast cell tumors are the most common malignant skin tumor of dogs and actually it's a disease where there's been a fair amount of progress over the last 30 years. Um, so some older drugs have been repurposed for mast cell disease like vimblastine and CCNU. And um, the, then there are newer drugs that have come on the market, um, Palladia, which new, but it's, it's been with us for 10 years. And now there's a new treatment called um, Delphinata, I believe is the name of it. And it is a extract of an Australian plant um, that you inject into the tumor uh, to get rid of the mast cell tumor. So th there, there's actually a lot of um, improvements in treatment of mast cell disease since I first started. Great, great. Um, we have a question about bloat versus uh, GDV. Um, and I know that that is also a myth sometimes that your dog or will um, bloat if I think if they exercise after eating or something. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think it, it's worth talking a little bit about um, the so difference between them as well. Yeah. Bloat, bloat, is, bloat is a colloquial term. Um, and I, I don't know that it has a strict definition. Gastric GDV is gastric dilatation and volvulus. So gastric means stomach and dilatation means distended and volvulus means twisted. So um, some dogs just have gastric dilatation where their stomach gets all distended with food or air. And then we have to take the air out um, and the dogs can be really sick because that big balloon distended stomach um, compromises blood flow. So they can be really sick, but gastric dilatation and volvulus where the stomach twists around itself and basically tying the blood vessels that supply that stomach into knots, um, then that is a real, that is an even worse emergency. Gastric dilatation is an emergency. Gastric dilatation and volvulus is a, is a even bigger emergency that requires a, a surgery right now. Um, and the stomach needs to be untwisted. And then any stomach that's lost its blood supply, and sometimes the spleen loses its blood supply in the whole thing. And then the spleen has to be taken out and the stomach has to have the parts that don't have a good blood supply removed as well. And the stomach has to be reconstructed. That That is a huge bona fide you know, all hands on deck, middle of the night emergency kind of thing. And no one really knows what causes it. Deep chested dogs um, are most prone. So it'd be unusual to see it in like a Cocker Spaniel, but Great Danes and standard poodles, anybody who's wide in the front and skinny in the back is a, a dog at risk. They're drinking ice water. There's all kinds of myths around bloat. Drinking ice water, no, um, probably not. It. Exercising after eating, probably not either. Maybe eating too fast has something to do with it. Um, but there's not a lot of hard information for people to prevent it 
at home. And the, the one thing that can prevent um, volvulus from occurring is that we often, when a dog is spayed or neutered, will um, tack the stomach down, do what's called a gastropexy. Gastro meaning stomach and pexy meaning ta uh, tack it down. So that holds the stomach in place and it can't twist, but dogs whose stomachs have been tacked can still bloat or still have gastric distension. And I have had patients who've had multiple episodes of gastric distension, even though the stomach is tacked in place and they don't twist. So it, it prevents the worst of the emergencies, but it, it doesn't prevent that a hundred percent. Okay, great. We have, um, Jan was asking these questions or making these same comments about packing and, um, bloat happening after that. So mm -hmm. you answered that. Um, let's see, I think, uh, we have more questions about the teeth and just cleaning dog's teeth. Um, anything to do clean to avoid dental cleanings or um, is there anything in, in addition to brushing? Yes, if you go to the uh, Veterinary Oral Health Council, if just put that in the Google search bar, they will list products by dog and cat, um, products that have been scientifically proven to prevent the buildup of plaque and tartar on teeth. And so anything on that list is, is kind of analogous to the thing on the back of the crest tube, you know, approved by the American Dental Council or whatever it says on your crest tube. This is the animal version, the Veterinary Oral Health Council. And so those would be products that you could use with great confidence uh, to help keep your dog's teeth clean. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, well, I see that we're already past uh, seven. So we're going to wrap up now. Thank you so much, Dr. Hohenhaus. Uh, You're terrific very presentation. welcome. As always, um, just a reminder for everyone, our, um, our next event um, is on August 18th at 6 p.m. I'm home alone, helping dogs adjust as we return to the office. Um, you can register on our website. So thank you again, Dr. Hohenhaus, and thank you all for joining us. Have a great evening and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Good night. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Good night.